Good afternoon and welcome to APA's town hall today entitled Shaping, Shaping Space and Place to Enhance Communi Connections and Build Community. My name is Suzanne Healy, APA's Director of Professional Development. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. We'd like to recognize the sponsors for today's event of Johnson <laughs> Control and Siemens. They are two long-standing partners of APA and we are very gracious for their support. All attendees are in listen-only mode and we ask that you utilize the chat box for Q&A segment of this session. While we attempt to respond to all questions submitted, should we run out of time, responses will be handled post the event. We also remind participants to ensure that your speaker volume is set for your comfort. As our speakers are gathering us from across the country and continent, Varying volumes will be present. Today's session will award professional continuing education credits as well as APA credentialing points and AIA CLUs. For AIA certificates, please email Billy Zydek at B I L L I E at APA.org along with your AIA membership number for assistance. Our webinar is now recording and will be posted to the APA website later this afternoon. Additionally, you will receive a follow-up email within 72 hours, providing a designated link to all webinar recordings. At this time, it is now my pleasure to introduce Lander Medlin, APA's president and CEO for today's event. Lander? Thanks so much, Suzanne and Billy, for all the support you provide in making these town halls happen. We really appreciate it. And welcome all attendees. We appreciate your decision to engage in this particular town hall as we delve further into the latest Thought Leader Series monograph on connection, space, and place, and the impact of our facilities on the institutions we serve. As always, I wanna thank you, each and every one of you, for joining the dialogue. Even if you come later with the recording, we really appreciate it, and that's what makes this a rich conversation and the special community we share. As we position our institutions to pivot from the pandemic into a brighter future, how do we re-envision new and different ways to intentionally make our spaces and places memorable, meaningful, relatable, enduring to enhance the student experience? A strong sense of place can arise naturally, but it can also be consciously and carefully cultivated. That's why we chose this topic today, shaping space and place to enhance connections and build community. It's also why we chose these few thought leaders symposium panelists who will discuss the role of the facilities organization and the built environment in fostering even greater community by further leveraging its sense of place. Now the format as such, this is the format for today's town hall. I'll introduce and set the context for our targeted topic. I'm gonna to recognize our stellar panel, provide an opportunity for your questions, and we'll conclude by highlighting additional resources and closing remarks. So I'll open now as your first panelist. Really nice opportunity to do this and set the context for our conversation on this topic today. For those of you who are not aware of what the Thought Leader Series is, We'll take a look at this slide. We form a stellar team of facilities professionals and senior institutional officers from across the education community of institutions to engage in a discussion of trends and issues, have a dialogue on all of it focused on the impact of the future of education and the built environment. The next slide highlights several goals with particular attention to the two bullets in the middle of this slide. Enhancing institutional dialogue, which Keith will discuss today and have uh, has really become a cornerstone to the monograph. And we also recognize the importance of connecting facilities operations with the institution's mission and outcomes. Now, this is one of our premier programs, chaired by Keith Woodward, is a member benefit, a huge value, all developed for and delivered to you for your benefit. Now, I know of no other association, and I know a lot of them, that provides this kind of deep dive into a targeted topic of interest and providing real impact for you and your use annually. 
Now, the context and significance of this monograph by the TLS team on shaping space, place, connection, and community could not have come at a better time. Not only did all of the disruption of the past 18 months reinforce facilities professionals' relevance, it revealed that forming connections by students is at the heart of the college experience. It reinforced the value of being together. This was further substantiated by an Ian Bogust, Georgia Tech professor of media communications, you can see it here on the screen, article in The Atlantic, October 2020, and it was titled, America Will Sacrifice Anything for the College Experience. And boy, he really does a great job at this. And look at the quote that I sort of mashed together from a few sections of it, but it says, undergraduates care more about experiencing campus life. What mattered most is their long-lived friendships, not their courses that came first to mind. Well, I know that our faculty members would not appreciate that statement. However, this is exactly what they found. The Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Ed, and so many other such publications also identified the same thing through their research. This puts facilities professionals at the heart of the campus experience. And so let me not gloss over your newly found relevance on your campuses. It's there, and you know it. You are poised and positioned to help your institutions be strategic rather than reactive. And that will be critical moving forward with the challenges we face, enrollment cliff and demographic shifts, global competition for students, funding, funding, funding. I could say yada, yada, yada. I believe there's a heightened sense of urgency. I really do. And I think we absolutely must move from a mindset of doing more with less to doing different with less. Care, where can we best position, be positioned to do this? It's with a focus on sense of place, right? But what is sense of place? I have a definition, it comes from the monograph, and we had several in that first uh, piece of the subject matter. And you can see from this side how important it is and how deeply sense of place resonates, or it should, with human beings. It's personal, it's intimate, it's emotional relationships and how they bind together to create meaning. It's the lens through which people experience and make meaning with place, so powerful. And again, that feeling of belonging and the symbolism associated with it. Or it could be placeless, hostile, dangerous. That's not what we want, but it can be without being intentional about it. So colleges and universities and K-12 preparatory schools have a long history reflecting the, their ideals and communicating their values and principles in campus designs. And we can do more. We're at that inflection point. I think there's a wonderful data point, and we call them those in this rather than sidebars. We call them data points in the monograph. And my reference um, really is about where it shows to serve as a, a point to speak to begin with ideals rather than specifications. Let me say that again. Begin with ideals rather than specifications. And it goes on to say, and I quote, what does the building need to say about the university or a particular college? How should the space feel? When students approach the building and enter it, what words should describe their first impression? What will students feel empowered to do in this space? Boy, if you don't understand the power of place from that alone, the monograph will help you because it, the power of place is palpable. Now, as you look at the different factors for sense of place on this particular slide, consider these examples. And as they each come up, and just let them roll, Suzanne, I wanna give you a couple of examples and I'm gonna pull out a couple of these. Iconic spaces should not be underestimated. For instance, when I was at the University of Maryland College Park, now I know it was a long time ago, however, it's still, uh, this still resonates with me. There's a bronze of the institution's mascot, Testudo, which is a terrapin for those of you who do not know, go Terps, 
it graces the approach to the McKeldin Library. Now, for those who are graduates or, or present students, we all know McKeldin Library itself is a valued gathering space. But rubbing Testudo's nose for luck before an exam or by an alum upon their return, I go do that when I return, is a time-honored tradition shared by students past and present. It binds them in a shared and memorable experience. And as a matter of fact, poor Testudo's nose is really nice and shiny because that's the thing people touch the most. So it's really pretty interesting. My second example, as you are looking at these elements, um, is that there's the creation of interdisciplinary science facilities. And they co-locate different types of students and faculties by incorporating spaces and amenities such as student spaces and classes, media labs, conference rooms, library carrels, food service and coffee houses or cafes, and Wi-Fi, always Wi-Fi, right? Co-locating space helps us to leverage opportunities for informal interactions or casual collisions. It promotes those connections and it encourages learning. So important when it comes to creating that sense of place. Now, I'm gonna close my section with the word intentionality. I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Are we intentional about those meaningful moments? Are we intentional about those meaningful connections? Are we intentional about those connections that match the student experience with the space? So my final illustration, and you might think this is sort of funny or weird, but that's okay. When making the movie Planet of the Apes, here we go, Keith, Joe, Lorna go, where is she gonna go with this? Is in fact, the apes, the orangutans, and all the other types of actors who are playing those, who are playing those characters or those parts went to the uh, studio commissary and they ate their meals together as a group. Well, that sounds ridiculous. Nobody told them to go do that, but that's exactly what they did. It might seem funny, it might seem odd, or it might seem just plain human. It was clearly about fellowship, right? It was a hugely important concept for the emotional aspects of human connection. As the architects of space, how are you intentionally creating spaces that enhance that sense of belonging and emotional well being? Let me now introduce our next panelist. I'm going to uh, walk through what we're going to do here. We have the awesome opportunity to hear from three other thought leader symposium panelists, and they are fantastic. They will share their perspectives and experiences, thoughts and ideas on the significance of Sense of Place, its criticality at this moment in time, the opportunities created by a new focus on Sense of Place, ways to address changing space needs and requirements, and explore questions for further discussion and dialogue on your campus. So our next panelist is Dr. Lauren Ruhlman, Principal and Director, Higher Education for Workshop Architects and Planning. This entity is a certified B Corporation based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which specializes in architecture and planning and strategy for student life, dining, and library environments. Prior to joining Workshop in July, Lauren worked in higher education for 32 years, including most recently as Chief Student Affairs Officer at Grand Valley State University and as Associate Vice President for Student Life at the University of Michigan. At Grand Valley, he oversaw the Division of Student Affairs and throughout his career has had responsibility for auxiliary services, facilities management, and out-of-class student engagement and well-being. Roman has presented at 40 conferences, authored 12 publications, consulted for two dozen universities, and led over a billion dollars in student life facilities renovation and construction projects, including housing, multicultural recreation dining, student center. Lauren? Well, I have to say in all those years, I've never followed a reference to the Planet of the Apes. So that's a first <laughs> for me, and I, I appreciate it greatly. 
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, delighted to be with you today. And what I want to say to start is the uh, thought leaders document is robust with recommendations, opportunities, observations, and data points. There are 12 major observations, a handful of challenges, too many really to cover in the next few minutes that I have with you. So I want to encourage you to read it, sit with it, talk about it with your teams, because there's so much, uh, uh, as Lander said, opportunity in, in the future here for us. I'm going to focus on four, and perhaps we'll have time if you're interested in the Q&A to talk about what some of those uh, opportunities that we didn't discuss here might be. Let me start with two big points, though, first of all. The observations we make in the thought leaders document were not born of the pandemic, although each of them revealed themselves in really, really significant ways during the pandemic. So therefore, if we can harvest the learning right now, we have a really bright uh, opportunity in front of us with higher education. The second point I want to make is the challenges, the, the complexities. They sound like um, insurmountable barriers in many ways, but disguised in there are those opportunities that you're going to hear throughout this, this town hall. I think this is possibly the most important and exciting time in higher education, certainly in my career. And this document offers some of those pathways that we might uh, we might pursue. Let me let me suggest to you the way I'd like to walk through these four observations. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to say just a couple of things about what we learned in these four uh, opportunities. Secondly, the opportunities that I think that we have with each of them. And lastly, with a few questions or maybe even provocations, if I can provoke some thinking here in this in this uh, town hall time. So let's get right into it. Observation number one. Uh, that this team, this group made is that sense of place improves the competitive position of the institution. Look, even pre-pandemic competition, competition for students was pretty brutal. It was it was rough and tumble. Uh, ask any chief enrollment officer to tell you they have to fight for every one of those students that we get enrolled that we take for granted when they show up for welcome week. That demographic cliff that that I've been living with in the Midwest and the Northeast, those of you in sort of my neck of the woods, it's been coming at us for a long time. The demographers have seen it. Maybe the only thing moving slower than that forecasted uh, cliff is our response to it. The pandemic uh, impacts were pretty significant. 40% of all students experienced some sort of financial disruption. The enrollment declines that you know about, maybe some of you have experienced, the document describes uh, are real. Uh, Negative two point down 2.8 percent for private four years, about four and a half percent for uh, private four years, uh, 2.8 for publics, 12 percent for two year institutions. You know, all the experts talk about how global competitiveness and social equity require more access. And we've got these trends, these dem demographic trends and the pandemic impacts there. Where's the opportunity in this? Well, the opportunity is what Lander said the Atlantic talked about, which is when students on our campuses were protesting the cost of education, why am I paying so much money for an online experience? They were talking about what they missed. What they missed was that college experience. And as you heard Lander say, I just left a 32 years of higher education, so I was helping manage the pandemic experience over the last year. And at least in my chief student affairs officer role, when there were student protests or reactions that were negative, when they were violating COVID restrictions, if you will, what they were really doing was saying they missed the socialization, they missed the connection, they missed the engagement, they missed place. They wanted those pickup basketball games. They wanted to have those faith-based services you know, on the beach. They wanted the road trips to other campuses. They even wanted a few parties. That desire for place and experience and engagement and connection is the thing that was missed the most. This is an opportunity for us in higher education. What are the possibilities? It's a competitive advantage. Uh, for most of us, perhaps, majors look uh, mostly the same to, to a, a prospective student. <clears throat> we all tout our graduation statistics. All of our alumni are happy, according to our surveys. But place can be distinctive. The features of geography, where the institution resides, the value system that we want to talk about, the story that we want to tell, the traditions that students have created over generations. Those are the unique possibilities that each campus has to draw distinction to its institution. The institutions that rethink place are rethinking competitive strategy. And by the way, the online and hybrid world, I think, is not going away. Uh, so we have to think about place even for those students that are hybrid or online. How do we make sure that they have some connection to alma mater in order to deliver on the promises of higher education? 
So the first observation is that sense of place improves the competitive position for the institutions that lean heavily into sense of place, into campus, into placemaking. The second observation that we make as a thought leaders group is that sense of place ensures that students feel like they belong to the institution, they belong to each other. Uh, the places that do that well uh, have students that are more likely to form connections, more likely to persist, more likely to graduate, more likely to give back to the institution, and more likely to be healthy and well. Uh, again, let me focus just a little bit about what I saw most profoundly in my student affairs role over the last uh, year and a half, and really what I'm hearing as I talk with other institutions around the country, both two-year and four-year, by the way, and that is the well-being challenges are significant. They're both acute and frequent. Uh, well-being, health, mental health have something to do with attrition and sense of place. Uh, the state of mental health, as we all know by some experts, has been called a crisis. Even pre-pandemic, 40% of all high school students reported anxiety that was disrupting their lives or their academic progress. And that was before coming to college. So this is, again, not something born of the pandemic, but something made much more visible to us in the pandemic. The pandemic's impact was severe and disproportionate on those who feel, historically, uh, much lev uh, lower levels of belonging. Um, you know, these, these lower levels of belonging for a long time have been felt by communities of color, by those students who, who reside in lower socioeconomic areas, who uh, are first generation or veterans or student parents or housing insecure. The campus for a while now has increasingly become a vehicle for caring and a sense of belonging for these students especially and these students who were most impacted by the pandemic. Uh, I will tell you that I took campus for granted. I took place for granted. Let me give you an example. Uh, our counseling and well-being and well wellness programs are really important in the ways that I just described. Most therapists or all therapists are licensed by their states. Regu licensing is regulated by the states. When we shut down quickly, when you shut down quickly, if students had to go out of state to go home, they could not continue with their well-being and their care, their therapy, because of licensing restrictions. Some students couldn't continue the therapy and counseling sessions from living rooms because the privacy is compromised. Many students, even if they had therapists nearby, didn't have transportation to local providers. So it points out, again, the importance of the campus providing the kinds of belonging and support that we need. Where's the opportunity? All of us now understand how loss affects uh, our feelings of connection to each other. We all experience levels of isolation. We all needed new forms of belonging and well-being. We can all use that right now, uh, the shared experience to create what our students need at our universities and our colleges. And the disproportionate nature of pandemic taught us that some of us need that more than others. So uh, I believe the future gives us an opportunity to create the kind of spaces that say, we notice you, we care about you, and this campus is where you belong. Third observation that we make, sense of place helps campuses become more inclusive. You know, again, the students most impacted by the pandemic were also those who for decades have told us they feel excluded from our campuses, particularly students of color. Now, research tells us that's been less true at two-year institutions, that's good news. But these are also the same institutions that experience the largest drop in enrollments and serve the highest number of students who often feel the most excluded. So there's some challenges there with some opportunities. You know, simultaneously over the last year, uh, at least in the United States, um, we have been reeling from a, a long overdue racial reconciliation and the speed of information and the speed of organizing and protesting is often much faster than our ability to react. So what's the opportunity when uh, these issues of inclusion and exclusion come up? Well, we have an opportunity to be less, less reactionary and much more intentional. Uh, the president of Dillard University, Dr. Walter Kimbrough, urged us last year to move from thin words to thick action. That is, to stop talking about it and get busy doing the work of inclusion. All universities and colleges, I, I believe, have probably declared some kind of commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what a moment we have right now for higher education to lead society in inclusive placemaking. We know that place Places signal visibility. We know they signal importance and inclusion to people too often overlooked on our campuses and in our communities. 
And campuses provide essential services to mitigate some of those systemic barriers, like uh, you know, barriers to inclusion, like the needs for tutoring and counseling and uh, food support and housing support. And most of the consulting clients I talk to are saying they're struggling right now with is issues of diversity, equity, inclusion. So that playbook is waiting to be invented by you and I. Uh, I think it's a really, really exciting time for us to deliver on the promises of higher education on our campuses proper. The fourth and last uh, observation I'll make is that sense of place fosters interactions between members of the campus community. And that rarely happens in purely online ways as we observed in the document. Too often in higher education, we work in silos unless there's a, a physical environment where accidental magic can, hurry, can occur, you know, that um, uh, alchemy or that collision that happens in physical places, the quad, the student union, the faculty club, the holiday party. The impacts of the pandemic showed us this. What we lost was that serendipity of interaction, that collision, that alchemy, that chemistry. What we gained was a forced interaction among new players who may not sometimes be in the same space at the same time. Uh, the um, dean of engineering with the county health director and the custodial supervisor, because we had problems to solve this last year, right? What we gained was the prominence of the facility leader in convening those conversations, in being the, the glue because of the nature of the campus and the nature of the pandemic to have that conversation hold together. So how do we leverage that, that role and that learning? What's the opportunity? I believe that facility leaders are the opportunity. Uh, facility leaders are perhaps the only neutral party, or one of the few anyways, with, with um, campus spaces that are typically owned by somebody on campus, the lab director, the student affairs director, that facility directors have this ability to sort of cut across all of that and pull people together. Uh, facility leaders are the ones who can, I think, convene the diverse viewpoints that might not otherwise be in that physical place, but in the future could be. Facility leaders are the one who see the university from all the angles and all the times. Who was on campus uh, when everybody else was somewhere else uh, during the pandemic? Lots of the facility folks. And this is true in nights and weekends during the rest of the year. Facility leaders see all of the ways the place comes together. Facility leaders exist at the intersection of faculty relationships, of facility expertise, and of a service ethos. So I think the opportunity is that this is the leadership moment that facility leaders have been waiting for to foster that interaction that only physical place can give us. So a few final uh, musings here. How can we leverage the expertise of facility leaders that others got to see during the pandemic to permanently improve how we collaborate in the future? What if, in addition to our annual campus safety walk, where we, for example, um, look at lighting and things like that, what if we added a belonging walk? to identify where students do or don't feel the most sense of belonging in our campuses? Could our facility processes include prospective students, parents, maybe high schools, business community leaders, so that we can make our institutions more aligned with expectations and more competitive from an enrollment management strategy? And then finally, how can we use our campuses as places that finally, finally create racial understanding, social equity, and support for the historically underserved among us? There's a saying that you've probably uttered yourself, you never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, I think the opportunities we have right now are huge, important, and exciting. I'm really bullish on higher education facilities and placemaking, and rather than the pandemic having taken us down, I think we can learn from it and uh, do some really, really bold things in the future. Thanks. That is really excellent, Lauren, and I so appreciate your comments because you really brought so many of those opportunities uh, full circle and the way you spoke about them uh, was really terrific. I think people uh, will appreciate it and they'll probably have more questions to ask of you. So now I'm gonna introduce our next panelist, Joe Whitefield. He's the Assistant Vice President, Facility Services Department at Middle Tennessee State University. Joe oversees all facets of engineering operations, maintenance, utilities, and construction in support of MTSU's mission. With a continuous improvement focus, he has implemented several innovative practices in operations, maintenance, utilities, budgeting, and management, capital maintenance, planning, and much, much, many, many more. Joe has published articles in Business Officer, Energy, Energy Efficiency Journal, and Epis Facility Manager. Currently, he is the host of 
The Thinking Bucket, a podcast that focuses on facilities management, organizational leadership, and economics. Joe holds a BS in mechanical engineering, an MA in economics, and is a graduate of the App Institute and the College Business Management Institute. Joe? Thank you, Lander. Uh, good to be with you all today. It's really good to be um, uh, joining you and be reconnected with uh, former thought leader uh, participants and to see you all again and uh, to revisit this topic from several months ago. A few things I want to uh, speak to as we try to take a lot of what uh, uh, Lander and Lauren have already laid out for us in regarding the overall concept of the sense of place. We want to take that and start to bring that down into space needs and requirements. One of you know, kind of start to put some meat on those bones relative to how that might play out on a campus for our facility uh, professionals and uh, campus planners, because I think there's, there, there is so much to this, and I really appreciate what Warren had to say about, uh, about this, this, this idea of what a sense of place means, how does that now become a driver for our changing space needs and requirements? Okay, uh, space needs and requirements by, by definition, changing means dynamic. They've always been dynamic. This is not a new topic. Uh, we we had this topic uh, before, and and it was we could have had this topic pre-COVID at any point along the along the way. However, I like to look at the uh, aspect that the fact that we came together to talk about this at a time where the pandemic created for us what I would call as a stressor, and that is all of the things that you thought about, all the things that you were involved with at your campus, and the things we were learning from one another. They're all being tested in real time by the stress of the pandemic. And so it gives you an idea about what's real, what's esoteric, what works and what do, and what doesn't work and how well your planning from the past sort of holds up. So, so I like to look at the stress. We've had other stressors in the past. We've had things like perhaps like active shooters or, or uh, you know, as, as a real driver for a lot of our thoughts, or we've had things like uh, protests on campus. A lot of people are going through some things like that and uh, so forth. But, but it's really important to see how these stressors uh, provide the opportunity to improve our, our thinking and our planning. So it was really uh, dynamic to meet with our uh, uh, other uh, uh, participants and thought leaders and, and to see how they were reacting to that. The goal, however, was not to make it about COVID. I know everybody's tired and, and, and exhausted from COVID. It is not to make it about COVID, but understanding that, that it being a stressor, I think can enhance the, the broader topic of trying to integrate sense of place with changing space needs and requirements. A couple of things that were certainly critical that came from that time, and I think that, that are, they're enduring and uh, already been spoke to a little bit, is how significant it is it that we meet in person? That's that's an, that's a question that was before and after, and prior we would might do that with surveys or we might do that with with studies and things like that. But now we really got an opportunity to see what that really meant. What are the benefits of the social, the educational, the productivity uh, uh, aspects of running campus in person? And one word that kept coming up over and over and over again was essential. Who are the essential employees? What are the essential services? What are the essential? You know? So again, that really drove us to find out not only what was uh, useful or what was good or what we liked and what was preferable, but what was essential. And so I, I really thought that's a useful thing to remember. And then also we learned what are the benefits and the costs of remote learning and remote meetings. Okay, those two things emerged in such a huge way, and I think most of us agreed that uh, 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 that the remote learning and the remote applications aren't going anywhere, okay? Uh, so as we think about these uh, drivers for changing space needs, I like to think about the pre-existing drivers, the one that we've been working on for a long time. We probably certainly have new drivers. And then I also think we have new consideration on the pre-existing drivers. Now that we've been stressed, now we get to go back and reevaluate some of those other things. Again, a lot of things that Lauren spoke to that were important to us. Um, so. Two trends that we think are certain to continue that staff and faculty will continue to work from home at least part of the time. That's something to, uh, as we think about space needs, uh, both on the how we service the campus and then and certainly uh, colleges, universities have, uh, we've seen the value of online instruction. And we'll like to deliver that in many forms uh, uh, digitally for uh, and need to enhance that. So those are two sort of uh, underlying things. So as we think about some of the drivers for the uh, space needs and requirements, one word that comes up over and over again is flexibility of space. How flexible are the spaces? I and mean, if you didn't need to flex before, boy, you need to now. Uh, you know, that's not, that's the, what I'll call pre-existing condition, but it certainly has new considerations with the stressors that we've had. You know, one example we had is not just the configuration of spaces, but when you take large spaces, we ended up 
as we started bringing people back on campus, we took large spaces and moved medium sized classes in there because we need the social distance. So we were thankful to have large enough spaces so that we could hold medium classes on, you know, uh, uh, on uh, campus. So uh, interesting, but the flexibility in terms of configuration and, and the varied uses of spaces. Um, better use of outdoor space. That's a, you know, if anything about the outdoors, things brought that to light now. I mean, even to the point of, uh, you know, we've been down the path before and still are when it comes to natural light and things like that. But now when you think about ventilation air, we've got to bring outside inside now in a better way and, and so forth. But, but just a better use of the outdoor space itself is very important. Again, the new requirements of uh, uh, faculty and staff in light of remote and hybrid work, those are going to be uh, uh, important drivers. And then the support of online learning. And, and I think Lauren alluded to this, and I'll, I'll mention this again. Um, how important is it to develop a sense of place virtually in the online environment? You still have to have a sense of belonging or a sense of connection, um, even though as, as we integrate and continue to use and, and produce, whether they're hybrids or standalone models, whatever they are, but really connecting folks, even in a uh, virtual, it's not a space, but it's a place, right? A virtual uh, virtual space, I guess. So, uh, so those are things to consider. Uh, we've had diverse populations, as we've mentioned, that's pre-existing, but again, that's, that's now being uh, challenged uh, in, in new ways. Uh, the underserved and, and uh, different uh, populations on campus, whether they're uh, of color or, or uh, what have you, it's very important uh, to know what those new expectations are of the diverse uh, populations, but also integrate them in, in new ways uh, uh, with, with full consideration of the drivers. Uh, business collaborations, industry collaborations, those are happening in new ways. Uh, and here's one I thought was really interesting that uh, was not uh, was new to me was this idea of reducing campus inventory of less desirable buildings. Now, uh, you know, on most campuses, space is a commodity. You know, space is your is your uh, medium, you know, your commerce. That, that is, if you didn't have anything, you could have you could have space. The idea that anybody would reduce space is kind of a foreign concept. But now the idea that space is something that not only does it have to be maintained and managed, but is a cost. But in light of these increased requirements, sometimes then maybe it's uh, past the point of diminishing return, and you should consider, uh, you know, a plan to reduce uh, campus inventory. Uh, so I think that's a, a, a new, you know, a, a new thought. On an, on an older idea. And then, and then we have this idea of centralizing or updating our space inventory and, and database and management systems. And I'll just say we're going through on our campus, and I'm sure many of you are, we're going through just a, a data management revolution, uh, the way we're doing it. And, and it's in facilities. It's not just in the classroom or it's not just in other administrative facilities. The things that we're doing with data analytics now is, is uh, super uh, uh, fun, it's exciting. and but it is more than that is so useful in these times where you need quick access to data and information related to your space, related to any number of reasons, right? As, as, you, as you manage the space in a dynamic and really on a daily basis. So uh, I think there's some opportunities there uh, that the monograph wants to bring up and wants to put in front of people so that you, be sure, you might be sure to ask these questions and, and learn more about this. Of course, all this is gonna lead to strategies for uh, dealing with those those new drivers or those uh, maybe even those old drivers with some new thoughts. So um, you need to consider, of course, the design uh, and the renewal of space for the flexibility. You know, update your design standards. What are those and what do they need to be? Are so, is social distancing uh, being you know factored in, factored out? You know, you know what have you done? I, I'd like to know what everybody's doing with all that plexiglass that we bought, you know, uh, back in the day. You know, I'm sure we have plexiglass forts all over campuses right now. And uh, so very interesting. What's the new uh, day going to look like when it comes to design uh, for your standards, your requirements, your expectations? What I want to point out is this, this uh, expanding the availability of outdoor spaces. Outdoor spaces that were primarily for gathering, you know, and social activities and things like that. Is, and, and those are certainly important. We're finding that out more and more. One of the things that we found is that we needed to, particularly, we had to increase the Wi-Fi in our parking lots. And one reason we had to increase the Wi-Fi in our parking lots is because if we came back to campus, we had students that would have an in-person class and then have an online class sandwiched between another in-person class. And, and really, where were they going to go for the in-between class that was going to be online? Well, you know, uh, having a substantial uh, commuter application here, uh, again, you go back to the gathering space and, and your car might be the place that you default to, right? So being able to have 
you know, uh, you know, uh, significant and, and uh, robust Wi-Fi to take a class in your car. Who would have thought of that? You know, uh, just uh, months and a few years ago. So we found that's a, a, a new thing to consider. Certainly have to improve the health of our buildings. And I, we, we, we know all about that, not only for pandemic reasons, but also, and I'll just touch on the mental health part of it. I think that's the, that's the derivative that we're seeing from not only the health concerns of the pandemic itself, but also the fact that there's this mental health component that goes with people being exhausted, people being tired, people perhaps, uh, you know, having, you know, bouts of depression because of all the, you know, conditions and things like that. So the stresses that come from that. So that's an entirely different, uh, for us, an entirely different thing to, to consider is the overall mental well-being uh, of, our, of our campus constituents, students and faculty and staff, all right? Residence halls have to be reconfigured and, and, and re-understood in, in, in light of this, uh, uh, these new drivers, um, updating our space standards are going to be very important. And then we'll, I'll reiterate, maybe close with the new IT demands uh, as we talk about Wi-Fi, but what comes with the Wi-Fi uh, access and improvements are going to be cybersecurity needs and things like that. And for facilities people, it's the support of the new technology that goes in that really leads and drives all the new ways of delivering content now is that, you know, that, uh, that Wi-Fi receiver or that, uh, you know, it has to have power to it and it's hanging somewhere. And if, you know, you have a storm, then that next thing you know, we've got bucket trucks and people out there helping get the Wi-Fi running. So there's all kinds of collaborations associated with this. We're now uh, much more collaborative with other departments on campus, including our IT department and, and many, many others. So um, let, let me sort of end right there we, as we think about those drivers, about those strategies, and just say that the, that the value, I think, of the monograph and the thought leaders process is, is not to give you all the answers, but it's to present the topics in such a way that, they're, that they can be thought of in a more comprehensive manner. So instead of just saying one size fits all, what I really appreciated about that is that here are the drivers that we think, and these are being stress tests now um, for, for all of us, but I do think that this, this is a unique time because as, as we've all gone through the pandemic together and are still going through it, uh, while we're not all necessarily in the same boat, we're certainly in the same storm. So there's an opportunity for uh, a real uh, experience, shared experience that I think will, will make this uh, progress through uh, facilities and, and changing space needs and requirements, we can do that together more from an empathetic and a shared, a shared sense of, of, of common, commonality here. So anyway, I hope that's useful to you. And let me kick it back over to uh, Lander. Thanks so much, Joe. That was really terrific. Um, I'm struck by the collaboration element that you talked about and also um, that community colleges found the same thing with that Wi-Fi in the parking lots. For, for a little bit different uh, differences, their students had no Wi-Fi anywhere else. And so this was the place they needed to go to get it. So it was really interesting um, what has been occurring here. So thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to introduce our uh, final panelist, uh, Keith Woodward. Uh, last but not least here, Keith, <laughs> by any stretch, you he is the Associate Vice President for Facilities Operations, Quinnipiac University, and Chair of APA's Thought Leaders Series. Keith manages the day-to-day -day operations of 190 employees over 3.1 million square feet and 750 acres of property on three campuses in two towns. Keith's responsibilities include creating a culture of facility success and making sure the operations staff understand the importance of delivering on a positive student and community experience when on campus. In addition, Keith co-chairs the University Emergency Management Team and previously served on the University Center for Excellence Board for over a decade. And I believe, Keith, you were, or may still be, the uh, chair of the COVID uh, team on your campus. So, Keith? Uh, thank you, Lander. Um, I do help out a little bit on the uh, COVID task force a little bit as well. Um, so thank you everybody and thanks for being here. Um, my first and foremost, uh, thanks to Quinnipiac for our participation in APA. We always find value in APA. Um, and so it's, it's great to be a partner with them as one of the schools that participates. So I always thank our president, Judy Olian, and my boss, Sal Filardi, for allowing us to participate. Um, it's, it's a great experience. Later again, thank you and Suzanne for putting this all together. I think it's, um, as you know, it's one of my passions, the thought leaders. So uh, it's what I enjoy most about APA. So, so thanks for that. And when you have to follow Joe and Lauren, it's, uh, it's always a challenge because those are two incredibly bright individuals. And so 
to follow them is, is always a challenge, but I'm going to take a, a stab at it. So, um, and the focus that we're going to talk about is one, and Lander referenced it in the beginning, is that the, the monograph always, uh, for the last uh, probably five, six, seven, eight years, maybe longer, has had a section in it for questions. And so the, the design of the monograph is for you to be able to go back with pre-made questions uh, that you can talk to your supervisor about. And this can work, you know, both ways. This can work up to whomever your boss is, or it can work, you know, to your supervisors or superintendents or managers, whatever it is uh, you call them on your campuses. Um, and so we're just going to kind of go through them a little bit. Um, I, I don't have all the answers. Nobody does. That's the point. Uh, the point is to start the dialogue and to start to figure it out on everybody's campus, which is a little bit different. Um, so if we can put those up, uh, that would be great. We'll start with number one, which is um, iconic spaces. So you are very familiar, no doubt, probably with the iconic spaces that you have on your campus. Uh, you know how you support them. You know how you uh, work with them. Um, I think during this last year and a half, we've, and later talked a little bit about creating memorable experiences, but there have been some other spaces on campus that have developed, and you should be paying attention to what those spaces are and listening to the students and telling, and they're, they're telling you by their, either by their geographic location or by uh, the constant desire for services in those spaces. Um, they are they are there, and how do you get them to evolve to be another space? As Lander kind of mentioned in the beginning, it's about the friendships and relationships that a lot of the students uh, remember about their college experiences. It's also about their iconic spaces. You know, it's the Duke University Chapel, it's the Stanford Quad, it's the University of Michigan Ann Arbor Stadium uh, for football. It's those things that those are grandiose perhaps for many of us that don't have those things but there are spaces on campus that you should be thinking about and additional spaces that may have evolved over that over that time period so um, lauren touched on it it's a competitive advantage for those spaces and we should take advantage of those competitive advantages that we have uh, on our own physical campuses um, the next topic that we have is a uh, or the next question that we ask is how can campuses better meet the needs of a more diverse student population? And that needs to be, and I think it was Lander or Lauren that mentioned intentionality. That has to be very intentional. Um, it has to be, this is a hard question to answer. Um, it requires collaboration across the platform, uh, the business platform, uh, to make sure that you're hitting all the salient points that need to, need to be met when you're thinking about this. Um, and this, this is as um, we had some, we did some presentations earlier uh, in the year, uh, back in June and July. And this, this question is a very challenging question, but you have to ask it if you're trying to improve your uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? You have to ask the question. You have to think about it. You have to do it with intentionality. Um, and work toward some, toward some resolutions. I mean, it, it, there's just no two ways about it. And if, if you're not doing things like this, then you should ask the question. You should bring the question up to your supervisor and ask, how can we do this? Like, how can we support this? Um, because I think those will all be um, important things. Um, it, it, in the monograph, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to read very much from the monograph, but uh, there's, a, there's a quote in here. Is the programming in that space in that space, celebrating, bringing awareness to various issues of cultural diversity and how well we communicate those across those areas. That's a, that's a takeaway for you, right? So that's something that, as you read it in the monograph, that almost helps you lead into the question uh, that you want to ask uh, on your own campuses. So question three talks about residence halls. Um, and certainly, as uh, Joe referenced a little bit in his conversation, but certainly in the last year and a half, we've learned a lot about our residence halls because that's where primarily all of our students could only go, right? Um, and so how does the residence hall experience, you know, you may have thought you had enough uh, space in there. You may have thought singles were, were something you'd never do, but maybe now you might do more of, uh, you might think, you know, you had quads. Well, we're not doing quads again anymore because of, you know, of what we experienced. 
So you, again, it's with intentionality, it's with an understanding of what worked and what didn't work that you need to kind of evaluate as you, and you probably have already started to go through this, this uh, process. Um, but as we look at the things that happened, what was successful um, in our residence call community and what did we struggle with? And so when we think about our master planning or our capital development, and we think about what resources we want to put into those new spaces or how we want to renovate those new spaces, um, we should think about those things. I know on our campus, we just we took uh, some doubles and turned them to singles um, in two or three of our buildings just uh, for that, because we were hearing from our students that that was something that we were, that they were interested in. So you have to, you have to listen to that. So number four is how do we help with students who are learning uh, online and, and have a sense of belonging? This is another challenging question, right? Developing that online community and making them feel like their sense of space, which may just be their computer or whatever, is equally as important right, to the institution. Those things are, those individuals may not be on campus as frequently, but they are equally as important. And how do we, how do we shuffle that? How do we bring that to the top of forefront of our mind? Um, you know, I think you know, one of the shining examples even pre-pandemic uh, is Southern New Hampshire University, right? I think everybody's familiar with their online presence and how they make you feel as an online student um, is something I think we could all probably um, probably learn from. But it's complicated because there's um, it's a digital space or it's a virtual space that you have to try and um, take a, you know, take to a different level than it presently is. Joe touched on our next question, which is outdoor spaces. Um, but certainly, I think universities are thinking about their outdoor spaces a lot differently than they did before. Um, you know, people, especially up in where in the states where it's colder, may be thinking about um, things like ice skating rinks outdoors or different different things they can use uh, outdoors uh, a little bit more than they had before. And I think students also told us where those gathering spaces were. So understanding about those outdoor spaces and asking the question, what can we do? How can, it's a healthy environment outside, as we're all aware. Um, and so that space needs to be safe space. It needs to be um, developed perhaps further than it is developed at present. Um, and perhaps there's even some new ways of thinking, you know, things that you might not have done in the past that you did last year that you were like, oh, that wasn't so bad. You know, we could, we could enhance that experience as well. So the outdoor space is something that I think is, uh, is something that we all want to want to focus on. Um, the master plan, um, right? So the master plan was, in many cases, was developed and evolved before COVID, and that may need to be looked at. Sitting down with that and kind of going through that with a, a little bit of a fine-tooth comb saying, hey, we were thinking about X, um, but here's what we saw, which was Y, and how did those two things merge together? Um, so there's some there's some good data points in the monograph. I'm not going to read them to you, but there's some good data points about master planning and how it may need to be revisited just for, you know, take a second look at, which always is good to do just on a regular, uh, regular basis. But generally speaking, I think because of what we've gone through uh, in the last year and a half or so, um, and probably will continue to go through for a little bit of time here. I don't think we're, I think we all agree we're probably not past the pandemic. Um, but the master plan comes into play, and so you should take a, take a, take that into consideration. And I think Lauren nailed a great point where we are at an inflection point or a transition point for facilities leadership to have a voice because during the entire uh, you know last eighteen months, we, generally speaking, we were all here. Um, we were all here. We saw things that people didn't see, um, and so I think that lends our voice. You know, gives us a little bit. Um, a little bit more credibility in that conversation. So should we, we should uh, leverage that and take advantage of that to, to, to all in the best interest of our students. Um, I, I, we could get into the overall health and wellness of our built environment. I think Joe did a good job talk, talk, talking about that, but certainly, you know, the, you know, the safety and environmental uh, indoor air quality and ventilation and stuff like that, I think those are, are well discussed at this point. And I think, um, we can continue to discuss them, but you, I'll, I'll just turn you over to the monograph at that point so you can 
um, go through that. And then lastly, um, what steps does facilities management uh, need to take to reassess its priorities around space? Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, also challenging sometimes to ask, right? Because change sometimes is difficult for people. Um, but you know, you need to, you need to, you need to put yourself in that uncomfortable. You have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, if you will, um, to answer some of those. Um, but you have to be conscious about it. You have to be uh, intentional about it. Um, and you have to look forward at what the campus will look like. Um, and so that needs to be stressed to the operations team in terms of things will be different. You know, the, well, we've never done it that way. Yes, that, that's true. But you need to be open to, to change. Um, and I think if you do that by reassessing your, your priorities, that will probably be an outcome of that. So, so with all that said, those are the questions. Um, and there are many more that you can probably take from when you read it. And again, it's a, it's a lengthy document. Um, and I think Lauren and Joe have really done a great job, and Lander have great done, done a great job kind of going through the, the highlights of the sections of, of the monograph, uh, which we've tried to do today. Um, but I will say uh, the questions, as, as long as I'm involved, will probably still stay because I think they're great takeaways for people um, to go back to their campus. And that's the whole goal. I mean, this is one of Apple's premier content vehicles. Um, and it's designed for members, and it's designed for you to go back and have conversations. So with that, I'll conclude and turn it back over to Lander. Thanks so much, Keith. And uh, you're absolutely right about the question set. If folks are uh, do anything else, go to the question set and utilize them, as Keith was talking about them, um, utilize them for a conversation right in your department in your shop, in your particular area. Utilize them to drive um, a, a larger conversation with senior institutional officers. Senior institutional officers like um, Lauren are, are part of this on purpose because they have um, really great thoughts about how facilities should be uh, thinking about alignment. And so this gives you an opportunity with a set of questions already designed for you to have that kind of conversation and that dialogue. So I really appreciated that. And we do, speaking of questions, we have some questions that are coming through. And, um, and one particular person, is it's, it comes in the form of a comment, but I'd like for all of you um, to consider this comment and maybe give me um, your, your comments back about it. It's gonna take us back a, a a while back, but you'll see where I'm going as I make this comment. Keith, I'd like to start with you, and then um, we'll we'll go to the others, um, Joe, and then Lauren as well. But studies have shown that 62% of high school seniors made their choice of institutions on the basis of the appearance of the campus buildings and grounds. Now we know this was Ernie Boyer. I have quoted this probably more than any other quote in my Apple life. That was done in 1987. It was reinforced by APA studies and the Center for Facilities Research in 2006. But I'd love to hear um, any comments that you might make about how we now bridge between that very fact, do you still believe it's that fact, and uh, how do we bridge? Keith, might you help us with a comment or two about that? Yeah, sure. Um, not only do I believe it, I believe the percentage is higher. Um, just talking to some of our uh, admissions and enrollment management folks in terms of if they can get them, if they can get students on campus, you know, if, the, you know, we feel at least at Quinnipiac and I'm sure across the, across the platform of everybody who's on the, on the call, um, feel the same way. If you can get folks to campus and you can show your campus in a way. And I think, you know, it's funny. I think, I don't, I don't know if I've always had that thought of this thought that I'm about to say, but I've recently had this thought where, you're not only selling the student, you're selling the parent as well. You're having this conversation with a parent because they want, especially in the world that exists today, it's different, right? And it, you want to feel safe. You want to feel like you, when you drop off your child, the environment is, a, is one that you're comfortable with. So you're doing, you, you, well, to me, the, the connection needs to be with the parent as well. Um, and so, we had an old admissions person that used to work for us that said, you know, if I can get them on campus, 95% of them, I can get them to sign up. You know, we'll work out the financial aid and work out all the other factors that, that matter. 
but yeah, no, I agree with that survey, and I think it's very relevant and speaks even larger to the topic, right? It speaks larger to why all of what we're talking about today is really important, because it is that sense of place that matters to people when they walk on. I mean, it matters when you go to, you know, anywhere, right? You need to feel a certain sense that you belong here or you make a connection to it. So I would say, yeah, I would agree. Excellent. Joe, you want a couple of comments you might like to make about it? Sure. I mean, I, I think it's uh, certainly a, an important consideration uh, for students and their parents and uh, particularly the traditional students and their parents. It's, 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 it's very important to have that impression. We all, we all know you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And so, uh, so we believe that and, and, and go to that. But, but beyond, I think, I think this, there's two things that come to me beyond that. And that is one is when they come to your campus, they see it and they, and they identify with it. But the second thing is beyond just the environment and the, and the, Place. Again, it's that sense of connection. I think that's one of the things that's going to be different now. That how well will I fit in with with the culture and my peer groups? You know, who will I, who will I be connected with? Not just what you know, where will I be connected? So so while I do place a lot of value on that sense of place, just physically, there's that there's that social connectivity now that I think they go that, and I think we see that not only just can you get them here, but can you retain them? You know, so it's like that may be your choice for making the decision, but but is, does that take you from being a freshman to a sophomore to a junior to you know to graduation so does it sustain you through that so so the importance of it uh, is, 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 is certainly significant but uh, when I think about transfers and I think about you know the way that uh, the way that that can impact the future decisions to come back right uh, I, I do believe in its importance uh, and we, and we uh, you know we focus on that but also going beyond that to get into that sense of connection and getting that social connection that goes with it that really enhances the retention on the backside of uh, just the excess and the admissions, I guess. That's, and that's nice a great and point, Joe. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go a second later, but that's a great point, right? It's not just the first year, it's the full experience. And I think Joe really defined that very nicely for everybody. It's not just about that the admissions step, which I think the question focused on, but it's about the four, three or four years that follow. So sorry, I just wanted to make that point. No, you're absolutely right, and that's what I was going to uh, draw th through and to Nathan Graw, um, his two books on this whole demographic side really speaks to um, in the second one retention, and you know we could we can lower the pressure on the institution with respect to enrollment if we can keep those retention numbers up. So that's really perfect on uh, both your part. And Lauren, I know you have some yeah. things to say about this. <laughs> Yeah, just a couple of quick things. One is, uh, you know, no need to pile on to the agreement around, yeah, the, the place matters a lot for enrollment management. And and I would say that in some ways, the great failure, if I could use that language of higher ed, is the retention problem, the persistence problem. So I think you're absolutely right about retention, how how few come and then don't go through. And it feels a real, a real failure on their part uh, in higher ed. Let me say two things just to scaffold on. I want to mention the importance to the enrollment strategy from two perspectives. One is, um, there's a, a couple of faculty members, and this is sort of back in the era of Ernie Boyer's prolific writing too, but their name, uh, uh, Carney Strange and James Banny, talking about uh, the power of space to influence behavior. And they talk about the subcategory of behavior in space called proxemics. And it deals with the messaging that gets sent to, to, to people in all kinds of space. And you feel a certain way when you're in space, it's horrible or you know, great. And so um, the can it's more than the beauty of the campus too, I would argue. It's also the iconography, the symbolism, the, you know, the, 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 all of the ways we say something to people about who we are as a university in that admissions process. That's a really important consideration in addition to how gorgeous it is and how it feels when I'm there. Those messages are really, really powerful, for particularly, particularly for people who have certain kinds of needs, whatever those might be. The other thing I wanted to mention was um, this whole notion of bridging and bonding in space, meaning um, some space, um, you know, is the kind of space that pulls people together. It's communal, it, you know, it's, it's bonding space. Some space is bridging space, meaning it helps me cross some kind of threshold psychologically to commit to something or to somebody or to some group. And sometimes those spaces kind of keep me away. They sort of stay out. And so when the admissions game, we have to be really thoughtful, I think, about the kind of bridging space that says to people, um, this campus is for you. You belong here. Can you see yourself here? And then the retention game, I think, that that both Joe and Keith are raising is, I think, that bonding kind of space. We also have those kinds of spaces, too. So 
so I think, um, yeah, 62%, I think Keith's right, it's probably low. Um, and the retention game is equally important, maybe more important once we get them here. And to think then about the space in that bridging and bonding a messaging kind of way too. So that, that's excellent. And I think it takes us to, can we use that to bridge to, there, there are two thoughts here and, and um, Lauren, maybe you can help, um, I'll start with you first. And it's around this support of emotional well-being, the human side um, that uh, both you and uh, Joe mentioned, um, but can you bridge that, what we're talking about here in terms of recruitment and retention, to the uh, maybe the ways that we support emotional well-being, or, or just the just thinking about it a little bit uh, further, Lauren? Gosh, <laughs> wow, that's a big, big topic. Um, and I'm not sure. Let me let me say it back to you in the form of a question and see if I'm I'm getting this sort of how do we think about space with regard to retention and mental health and well-being? Is that is that kind of what you're gonna? That's absolutely right. It's the emotional well-being element that was really come yeah. forth with the stressors Joe mentioned and the anxiety and the 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 um the need for in some ways he talked about the fact that our students that may be the place, or Lauren, you may have said that, that may be the very place where they're getting that because they don't get it yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, so it's come up in all of our remarks today, the the important of, importance of the socialization element. And, and actually what students need, in my opinion, is no different than what you or I need, which is the sense of connection to other people. Loneliness is a little bit of an epidemic in this country, and it's not restricted to just college students, whatever their age. We all have this high need to feel like we belong to somebody. We'd be missed if we weren't there. And that has a direct correlation with, with mental health and well-being. Mental health and well-being has a direct correlation with retention. Uh, all the research will show that students who feel like they don't belong or aren't noticed or don't feel like they can be successful for whatever reason, because they're not getting the support services or whatever, are more likely to attrit. So there is, you know, there is a linkage between these things and the spaces we need have to run the gamut from those private uh, confidential spaces for treatment and therapy to those large civic spaces, large civic places where you know you're part of a community. And both of those things, at least in my opinion, both of those things are really important when we think about the campus placemaking so that we have these small private confidential uh, um, places for the, what I need for me to get better or to be, know myself or develop my value system or have private conversations or learn to be in a relationship with somebody. And these civic, big public plaza places and spaces where I know I'm part of a community and I'd be missed if I wasn't there. Um, I don't know if I got at your question, but that's what I'm thinking. That, that whole gamut is really important for mental health and well-being, which is really important for retention. Excellent. Yes, that's great. Um, do Joe or Keith, did you want to comment? I'm seeing head shaking a little bit. You you good to go? Okay, next I'm, question. I'm, I'm, well, I might just yeah. want to say one thing. One is when I think about spaces on campus, spaces facilitate relationships, mm. right? That's that's what they, they facilitate relationships, whether you're in the crowd of 100,000 at a football game or you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with somebody in the quad doing something, you know, and, and, and again, the, back to the human element. I mean, right now we think about retention or we think about, you know, everything looks like a statistic, but people, students, and our employees, they're not statistics, they're people, and we're people. And so so anything that uh, that gets us more connected with our folks, like, like again, I, you know, the, the opportunity for empathy now is, is better than it's ever been, because we've all been through some sense of, you know, either loneliness or, or, or whatever it is, you know, we've had some amount of, of difficulty or struggle associated with uh, you know, with the stressor, right, with the pandemic and, and other things. So, so I see it in students. Uh, I, I certainly see it in my uh, team. You know, people I work with, coworkers, and things like that. So, let's not forget the people we work with because we tend to be service providers, and we think, hey, we've got to be there to meet this need, meet this need, meet this need. And and while that's true, that in itself can be a big stress to be all things to all people. But but ultimately, it's a it's about us as you know, as as humans, right? I mean, there's great business books and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day. Most of what we know about connecting with people is just kind of what we know about being a person, I think. So, um, so I wouldn't, I just don't want to lose sight of that. As, as we Very taste good. It. I think that's excellent. There are two questions that I'm going to um, read aloud, and they are similar, but and and they have a little bit different angles. 
Um, and so think about it, because I'd like all of you to comment on these, and, and, and they're tough, so they're going to be meaty. Um, it says, what's, what are strategies to get university leadership to divest or remove buildings? Here we go. Even with the life cost analysis, um, cost to take down versus full modernization versus new build, um, still can't make headway and have multiple money pits and underused or, uh, let me get the last part of this, or unused buildings. Now, the, the question that also relates to this as well is paying for the changes is always a stumbling block. Facility officers should drive consolidation on campus and eliminate our deferred renewal backlog uh, and shift operating dollars from what is eliminated to what we need on campus. So you started to talk about that a little bit, but you see how both of them are pretty similar in terms of what um, the folks are driving at. And I thought that rather than one at a time, I thought that maybe you could think about those and and uh, help us consider uh, how we give, how, how we consider the kinds of strategies that we need to put forth in front of university leadership. Keith, can I start with you? No. No, okay. Oh, uh, sure, sure, Please. sure you can. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, you weren't wrong when you described it as a meaty question. Um, yeah. And I think to some degree, the second question helps answer it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the, de the deferred maintenance is, is certainly, it, that needs to be a talking point on campus. Um, and I think engaging other members of the community in that conversation may help this process, depending on, um, again, not, not specifically talking about just one building, but specifically talking about the entity as it as it is um you know we we have also started to divest a little bit uh of our real estate um and so but that needs to be you know that that's a mindset too right you know i think it's it's key it's important to keep key strategic land spaces that you are near your university i think and so i'm sure there's um i, I don't know the specific specific person but if is there a diversity a divestiture plan is there a plan to procure certain properties when you get them? And I think if there's a, an overall strategy to all of that, I think that makes sense. Um, and so that may help in the conversation where you talk about, hey, we just, you know, we just bought you know, 10 Main Street. We really should sell 42 Main Street because it really is no value to us anymore. Um, so I think you can have those conversations when you, when you, uh, when you have new properties. But I do think the deferred maintenance plan is uh, ripe for that conversation. Um, and if you've gone through that, and if you haven't gone through that, that's a that's a process that you know you should you should probably go through. But I'm guessing this person's asking that question; they've already been through it. But um, you just need to raise that level up. We all have, you know, Joe has them, I have them, everybody on the phone call has them. Has the roof? I've got a 1969 boiler still here. You know, we all have some of these issues that we continue to struggle with. Um, but you know, as long as it's as long as you get there eventually, I guess that would be my my takeaway. I like that, um, Keith. It really is using. You can use this document um, as a way to reposition the institution's thinking about um, those very areas of need. So that's really great, um, Joe or Lauren. Would you like to uh, expand on this pretty big one? <laughs> I, I will, if you don't mind, Lauren, I'll go ahead. And, because I, I, when well, I agree with Keith, I think the deferred maintenance or the deferred capital renewal is certainly a major part of it. Um, buildings that are just more costly to maintain or to, or to bring back or renew or whatnot. One of the really cool things, I'm going to go to my uh, nerdy engineer self here. Um, we've been doing through our master plan for a number of years. We have been doing a lot with that uh, deferred maintenance and, and building rate, building condition assessments, right? So, and just think about buildings in terms of A, B, C, D. But one of the great things that I think we've done that has expanded the conversation is we've included another column called program suitability. And this is where we engage the academic folks at how well does this building serve the program need? And then you might rate it A, B, C, or D, you know, find your criteria. Um, because oftentimes what, what can drive the decisions is not the condition of the building, but it's the how well or how poorly it serves a program. You know, it's, it's a functionality equation that will say, hey, we don't need this anymore because it's going to, you know, 
we can have a building that's in very poor condition, but we need it programmatically. And so we might invest way more than, than, than you know, might be reasonable or typical because it's so important to us strategically. And we all have those iconic buildings, you know, that, you know, will never go away. I mean, a lot of buildings are like academic programs. You got, once you get them, they're never going away, right? So, so, so the point is there's other things, deferred maintenance and deferred capital rule is a huge driver, but, but we've spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, we got some great bubble charts, you know, that show a you know two a matrix with some program suitab uh, suitability uh, juxtaposed against the building condition, right? So that so that expands the conversation uh, uh, quite a bit, and uh, maybe opens the doors to you know th this is not only in bad shape, but it's not doing us any good programmatically. So that mm -hmm. kind of makes it more of a higher priority to maybe get rid of or re or totally repurpose. So. Mm -hmm. I like that alignment programmatically because then that helps with uh, when you did building condition with it, maybe prioritization of need. And boy, if you start getting people to have a disciplined approach to prioritization, you may actually get them to move the next step, right? That's a really great comment. Uh, Lauren, would you like to comment on yeah. that? Sure, I'll just add. I was hoping if Keith and Joe went, we run, we run out of time on this question, but I I do have a couple of thoughts. What, this is a little bit of riff on Joe's uh, point a minute ago. That is, we we all. I think almost everybody has standards, base standards. I've been wondering a little bit is, should, do we have principles? And, and principles sort of help us get at this issue of um, uh, highest and best use. Uh, it's a little bit of the program driven kind of thing that Joe was talking about. And, um, you know, the sen if sense of place matters, um, then we need to have some principle about that being as an aspiration. Um, if, if, if sense of place is important to competitive position for the institution and brand equity in the marketplace. There should be a principle around the institution's spaces and buildings and systems relative to brand equity in the marketplace. There should be a principle around satisfaction and faculty recruitment. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 not that the traditional way we've done it is wrong. We need that too, but it's maybe a, another order of conversation with folks and maybe therefore different people in the conversation that would be typical back to the facility leaders, convener of the diverse viewpoints to sort of get at a different way to think about the space, which might help us get to different decisions on whether they still serve our purpose if we're thinking about those, you know, those, those brand equity kinds of things too. Just a thought. That's, a, just, that's really a great thought. Um, and it does align with uh, we're talking about design standards, we're talking about standards and the values that we're trying to communicate with that meaning. So the principles uh, that you're identifying is a great way to rethink because we're trying to get people to think differently, right? New focus, new new paradigm. Hey, Leonard, it's always amazing that if you ever vacate a building, uh, the number of tenants who are ready to move in. You're right, no matter, <laughs> no matter how, you know, it's like they line up because it's always in some percent better than what they have. So it's it's really hard to kind of get to that sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. so. It is. Yeah, there's and, a, and go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, Joe, I, I had somebody once tell me, you know, Lauren, uh, uh, people will fight you over money, but they'll kill you over space. That's right. <laughs> you know? We did a space um, document, uh, Thought Leaders, back in 2012. Very well received, and that was exactly the quote <laughs> that so true. All right. I'm going to I'll bring it to a totally different um, uh, topic, but it said prior to pan the pandemic, it was very important priorities were campus carbon footprint, sustainability. So Omar says, so do you think the pandemic changed those priorities? And do you think that they are um, divergent priorities now? And that's a hard one um, in my head. And, I'm going to go to Lauren <laughs> or maybe first to Joe. Well, I do this to Keith, but Lauren? I think sustain. So um, I can't remember which founding father said this, but every every generation needs a revolution. That was the quote. <laughs> I think sustainability is this generation's revolution. It changes everything the cars you drive, the food you'll eat, and where you buy it, and how far you'll go to get it. The, shoes you wear. I mean, I, the, the notion of sustainability as an all-encompassing uh, concept and commitment of way of living, I, I think quite possibly is, is this generation's revolution. I think it's important too, and I think it, uh, if anything, it's become more significant, uh, to be honest with you, Lander, not, not less. Um, in many ways, one could even look at online learning and, and the way we're, we're convening right here as a really green, you know, smart way to meet. 
so um, I, I actually don't think that, uh, I, I don't think, um, I think we're, it's sort of all of the above. Place matters and we have to find more sustainable ways, greener ways, net zero ways to actually do all the things that are important to connecting and communing. And I think this generation and the one coming will, will demand it with little patience for um, how hard it is to get to. I think it's, you know, it's, it's just going to be more personally. That's terrific. Joe, do you want to add to that? Well, only to the extent that, I mean, I agree. I think uh, they're certainly not going away uh, and, and, and nor should they, right? I mean, you know, stewardship that we have uh, is, is that shouldn't go away. It shouldn't just become you know, a trend or a topic that goes away. I think what's 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 happening now is just like everything that, uh, as I was kind of alluded to before, it's being stress test, right? Today, the whole the the you know, sustainability is being stress test by economics, by world events, by political events, by you know you name it, including the, up to and including the pandemic. Maybe that's part of what's behind the question is about have, have we just lost focus or is this putting a new focus? And I think, like everything, you know, there, you know, most of these things, as I'll say, there are no solutions, only trade-offs, right? It becomes a matter of what you're willing to trade off for, whatever it is, right? Uh, necessity being the motherhood of invention that it is, now we've got some stressors that are going to really put us. Uh, I think we'll see some advances in this in in a positive way in the coming years. Okay, not just in the form of mandates to do things and signing up to packs that you know. Uh, are, are, are 30,000 foot, but we're going to really begin to see what campuses can really do. What are those uh, first level things that make a lot of sense that bring the most value? And then how do you work from that? So I, I'm actually excited. We've, we've done a lot of things. I know people have done a lot of things, but it's interesting to see what really is what really uh, what really drives this, because I, I do think it's an evolution as much as we'd like to just have it done overnight and be totally sustainable and zero, you know, uh, net neutral and all those kinds of things. Those take time. They're just much more complicated. They do. Uh, so uh, it'd be very interesting to see where we're going. It's not going away, but I actually think, uh, as Lauren alluded to earlier, I mean, this is a good time for that because there's some there's some reality being injected into that conversation now that probably has it's probably been needed in my opinion. Very good. Keith, did you want to add, or would you like me to? Okay, very good. Then um, uh, where I'm going to head is. Um, back toward the beginning, we had someone say, do you see the new plan as bricks and mortar for the students and clicks for the faculty and staff? <laughs> Keith, you're smiling. <laughs> Don't go in there. Uh, you're on mute. I want you to take yourself off mute. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't remember the year, Lander. You'll probably remember better than I will, but we talked about this as one of the thought leaders uh, conversations about online learning and things of that nature. And I was convinced back then that we would probably at this point in time, we would be a lot more online learning than we are uh, mm -hmm. presently. Um, and so that didn't happen. But I think, so, so I think we will be a lot more in person, personally. Um, and the reason I think that is because of what we just saw in the desire of our customers to be on campus. The desire to have a relationship, the desire to have an experience. Um, yes, you can absolutely you can have that with clicks. You can, but it's different. Um, and to I think it was Lauren said or, or Joe said something about your own self of purpose and your own self of who you are and what you're here for is enhanced, I think, by the on ground experience. Um, and I have, I have come around to that. I was, I was definitely leaning the other way, probably seven, eight years ago, just based on what was coming down the pike. Um, but I have, I have transitioned back to, I do think that the, uh, the brick and mortar is probably here to stay. And that's why it's even more important that we, we create these spaces to make it more advantageous for them to want to come here. Right. But there's already desire. We just need to in, in, enhance that desire. So that's what I would say. Yeah, ensuring that the faculty and staff also uh, find that value, depending on who they are and what um, services they're delivering, can be incredibly important for that sense of belonging. Do you, your thought? No. Yeah, no. I think I think the I think the work from home. I think in that question, there's probably work from home or teach from home or teach from teach. You know, I think that's the the underlying gist of that question. So I think you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna see some of that. You're probably not gonna see too much of that in facilities just because we all need to be here to provide the service. 
Um, but you may see that throughout some other um, pockets of the institution, which to I think it was Lauren that mentioned, you know, silos. So you have to be careful in those situations when you don't physically see people. You know, going to going back to lunch in the cafeteria, right, is something that we may have all taken for granted. But you see people and you're like, hey, how are you? What's going on? Like there's there's natural mm -hmm. conversations and natural um, engagements that are happening that's that I think everybody everybody missed. So I'll I'll let somebody else go. You, you know, Lander, I would say I think um, I think I was where Keith was a bit some time ago too, thinking there's a shift gonna happen. I think I think it's possible what's gonna happen is it's additive. That is, you know, online and hybrid learning and alternative modes actually allow greater access to higher education rather than replacing what's happening now. And what faculty, I think we learned, I learned is faculty don't, at least the faculty we had, we had to make that switch, didn't necessarily love teaching from, they they miss the students. I mean, they, they wanna be with the students on the campus too, just as much as the students do. And the number one element related to retention, at least according to the research, is that faculty relationship. So I think they wanna be back, the students wanna be back, the place matters, the retention will be enhanced. And online and other modalities are really additive and good for increasing the access that we have to higher education versus replacing the thing that we know works well. That's That's my thought. Good, so Joe, you get the final comment on that before I go too close. Well, I, again, I just, I mean, I can agree with both uh, what Keith and Lauren are saying about that. It's uh, the idea that start thinking of it as an enhancement instead of a replacement. I think that's an important thing. I think we tend to, we tend to think like a lot of things in, in extremes, right? We're either way over here or way over here in a position. And and, and we, we use the term hybrid, we've used, you know, that, that comes, you know, uh, you know, moderate, whatever, you know, something that says, hey, there's something a little bit more off of either of those poles, you know, whatever it is. And so I think this is a good example of that as well, that that for some things that, that some deliveries are going to be, you know, perhaps even better online. And I think we're finding some of that and there are some advantages of working from home. And while there's advantages at times to be uh, uh, anonymous, I guess, on online and just kind of be, then we're also finding there's a whole lot wrong with that too, right? That, that, that not being known, not being out front, you know, not seeing faces. I even have that now when we have these, you know, these different type of meetings. I, you know, I like for folks to use their cameras and not just see the little box, you know, up as we have these sort of uh, these sort of meetings because it's, you know, again, the personal side is, is, is extremely important. So I, I think it's a it's 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 going to be a little bit of a blend, but I, but I think we've learned that it's not going to be all online and bricks and mortar are gonna go away. If anything, we've seen the, the the real value of that. And for and to be honest with you, a lot of folks, the most ornate buildings they're gonna see are the college campus, right, in their lives, right? And, and so there's there's just certain experiences that, that you know, when, as you're transitioning through life, this is where you're gonna see some of these things. And it's a unique time to do that and experience things. Uh, so I, I do not see that going away. I just see it uh, uh, being enhanced uh, perhaps by some of these other. I like that comment on on enhancing and as we do have a tendency to go all or nothing and, and it's really not what's happening. There was a question about references or resources or case studies and we'll respond to that um, later but I would commend the prior thought leaders uh, series preparing for the student of 2024. It really informs you about who these students are, what they're looking for, and they are looking for meaning, and they are looking for belonging, and they are looking to be part of this community. They want to be there, and I agree, Lauren, the faculty want, I do want to be there. They're just nervous about COVID, so we get that, And uh, but I, I think it reinforces this value as we close out of space and place, and I will say that if you have a physical space and you're a learning environment, this monograph is for you. Does that sound familiar, Keith? It, is, it truly is. So as uh, we conclude, a quick reminder about our call for volunteers, which closes this evening at midnight um, Eastern time. So really looking forward to volunteers um, leaning into these standing activities. Um, please also take note of our upcoming professional development virtual offering, the APA Facilities Symposium AFS. It's November 9 to 11, 2021 just a month and a half away. Registration is indeed open. We'd love to have you all there. You'll be talking about these kinds of topics. We want you to participate in APA's Facility Performance Indicators, FPI 2.0, and download our app called APA 365. 
try it out, stay connected. I think you'll find it of value. Um, there's also a slide showing notable resources, highlighting, and I really want to highlight our newest edition. Um, it's a new service called APA Advisors. I think that you're going to find that to be a really nice um, uh, addition to the suite of services that we offer with customized, scalable, tailored um, scopes of work for specific challenges and issues you have on your campuses. Um, a big thank you to our panel today. I really appreciate you so much. I don't think you know how much. And thank you um, all, all of you out there for the opportunity to serve you. Have a good day and a great weekend. Bye.